When I'm not working on the weekends, I spend every spare moment bow hunting. It's not just a hobby, it's a way of life for me. I own over 200 acres of prime hunting land in southern Illinois, nestled between rolling hills and dense forests. This property gives me a new adventure every time I step out, and I'm proud to say I eat everything I kill. It's not just about the sport, it's about respecting the land and the animals that inhabit it. I've always admired the Native American philosophy towards hunting. They believed in utilizing every part of the animal, from the meat to the bones, even the fat and organs. Nothing goes to waste. It's a principle I've adopted wholeheartedly. Trophies aren't my thing, generally speaking. I'll only keep something if it's my first kill of a particular species, and even then, I make sure to use as much of the animal as possible. But there was one summer evening when I had a shot at a trophy that nearly turned me into its meal instead. It's a tale that still affects me when I think about it. It was late August, about 10 years ago, and the day had been sweltering hot. As evening approached, the world seemed to transform. The morning had brought heavy rains, leaving the ground soggy and treacherous. I found myself sloshing through knee-high prairie grass, my boots squelching with each step. The humid air clung to my skin, and mosquitoes buzzed incessantly around my head. But I pressed on, determined to land some food for the coming week. As I crested a small rise, my breath caught in my throat. There, silhouetted against the light, stood a magnificent white-tailed buck. Its antlers branched skyward like a crown, and its muscular body tensed, ready to bolt at the slightest provocation. If I'd had a camera, that image alone could have funded a small vacation. But I had my trusty compound bow instead, and my growling stomach reminded me why I was here. I carefully knocked an arrow, my movements slow and deliberate to avoid startling the creature. The bow's pulleys creaked softly as I drew back the string, my muscles straining against the 70-pound draw weight. I took a deep breath, steadying my aim as I prepared to release. That's when everything went to hell. Like a crack of thunder in the stillness, the buck's antlers exploded into fragments. Something massive and dark had descended upon the deer with the force of a wrecking ball. In the dimming light, I could barely make out its shape, but one thing was clear. This was no ordinary predator. The creature was easily the size of a grizzly bear, but its build was all wrong. Instead of the lumbering bulk of a bear, this thing was chiseled like a bodybuilder, with rippling muscles visible even beneath its matted fur. And that fur? Good God, it was a mess. Patches were matted into what looked like dreadlocks, while others stuck out at odd angles. It was as if this beast had crawled out of some prehistoric tar pit, but it was the eyes that were absolutely terrifying. They glowed in the dusk like molten gold, in a way that made my blood run cold. This was no mindless animal. There was something almost human in that predatory gaze. I watched in horror as the creature seized the buck's head in its massive paws. With a sickening crack, it twisted the deer's neck a full 180 degrees. Then, as if to demonstrate its raw power, it proceeded to toss the carcass around like a child's stuffed toy. The display of strength was equal parts terrifying and awe-inspiring. As the beast's fury slowed, I could make out more of its features. It had the general shape of a wolf or large dog, but everything about it was magnified to nightmarish proportions. Its snout was longer, its teeth more prominent, and its overall size dwarfed any canine I'd ever encountered. Standing there in both shock and fear, I made a decision that was either incredibly brave or monumentally stupid, probably the latter. I decided that if I couldn't have my dear dinner, I'd at least come home with the trophy of a lifetime. This demon wolf, this impossible creature, would be mine. Now I don't know if you're familiar with modern compound bows, but let me tell you, they're not toys. With the right setup and a broadhead arrow, they can punch through hide and bone like a high-powered rifle. I'd seen arrows go clean through deer and exit the other side. In my mind, 
I was about to perform surgery on this monster from 40 yards away. I took careful aim, my hands trembling slightly as I drew back the string. The creature was still focused on its kill, giving me a perfect broadside shot at its massive chest. I steadied my breathing, found my anchor point, and let the arrow fly. The satisfaction of a perfect release was short-lived. To my utter disbelief, the arrow that should have punched clean through the beast's heart barely seemed to penetrate its hide. The monster reared back, letting out a roar that shook the trees and sent birds scattering in all directions. With a casual swipe of its paw, it yanked at my arrow, leaving behind only a superficial wound. In that moment, I knew I'd made a grave mistake. But some combination of adrenaline, stubbornness, and sheer stupidity compelled me to knock another arrow. I'd seen deer attack when wounded. Surely this nightmarish creature would be even more aggressive. As if reading my thoughts, the beast locked its burning gaze on me. In an instant, it was charging, covering ground with impossible speed. Its powerful legs propelled it forward in great bounds, closing the distance between us in seconds. Panic threatened to overwhelm me, but muscle memory took over. I drew and fired in one fluid motion, driven by pure survival instinct. By some miracle, my aim was true. The arrow found its mark, and one of those terrifying golden eyes exploded in a spray of gore. The red-fletched shaft of my arrow protruded from the creature's eye socket like a grotesque flag. It stumbled and fell, rolling several times before coming to a stop. For a moment, I dared to hope that I'd actually killed it. But my relief was short-lived. To my horror, the beast struggled back to its feet. It swayed drunkenly, shaking its massive head as if I'd merely slapped it rather than half-blinding it. The arrow remained lodged in its skull, a testament to its unnatural resilience. Perhaps deciding that I wasn't worth the trouble, the creature turned and loped off into the deepening shadows. I stood there, bow still at the ready, for what felt like hours. Only when the last echoes of its retreat had faded did I allow myself to breathe again. Determined to validate my experience and perhaps claim my trophy after all, I set about tracking the wounded beast, but to my growing unease, I found no blood trail. Even with an arrow through its eye, the creature hadn't left so much as a drop of blood on the ground. It was as if I'd been fighting a ghost. That was the last time I ever saw anything like that monstrosity. But the encounter left its mark on me. To this day, my heart skips a beat whenever I spot an ordinary wolf or coyote in the wild. For a split second, I always expect to see it rise up on its hind legs, transforming into that nightmare creature from years ago. Of course, they never do. They remain perfectly normal animals, oblivious to the terror that grips me in that moment. But I can't shake the memory of that evening. The impossible strength, the golden eyes, the arrow that should have killed, but didn't. I know how it sounds. A giant bipedal wolf prowling the forests of southern Illinois. It's the kind of tale you'd hear from a drunk or a madman. But I swear to you, every word is true. I was foolish enough, or brave enough, to try and take it down. I failed. Sometimes I wonder if it's still out there, waiting, watching, knowing where I live. And I can't help but think that maybe, just maybe, I'm the one being hunted now. I guess only time will tell. So there I was, out for a walk in my favorite forest. I remember it was just a normal day in northern Michigan. Sun was shining, birds were chirping, all that good stuff. I like this particular forest because it's pretty rugged. Not many people come out this way, which is perfect when you want some alone time. I'd been walking for maybe an hour, just enjoying the peace and quiet when things started to feel... off can't really explain it, but you know that feeling when the hairs on the back of your neck stand up? Yeah, it was like that. At first I thought maybe I was just being paranoid, but then I heard this weird noise. It wasn't like any animal I'd ever heard before. 
It was low and growly, but also kind of, I don't know, otherworldly. That's when I saw it. Now I'm not the type to exaggerate, but this thing was straight up terrifying. Picture the biggest, meanest bear you've ever seen. Now mix that with a wolf. And then imagine that Combo came straight from the depths of hell. That's what I was looking at. For a second, we just stared at each other. I was frozen in place, thinking maybe if I didn't move, it wouldn't see me. Dumb, I know, but fear does weird things to your brain. Then it let out this bone-chilling howl, and I knew I was in trouble. I took off running faster than I've ever run in my life. Adrenaline is a hell of a thing, let me tell you. But this monster? It was faster. Way faster. And smart, too. Every time I thought I'd lost it, there it was, cutting me off or hurting me in a different direction. The weirdest part was that it never went for the kill. It had plenty of chances. This thing was way quicker than me. But it was like it was... I don't know playing with me? Like a cat with a mouse, you know? Freaky stuff. I tried every trick I could think of to shake it. Ran through creeks, hoping the water would mess with its sense of smell. Zigzagged through the densest parts of the forest, thinking maybe it was too big to follow. Nothing worked. This thing was relentless. After about 20 minutes, I was getting pretty worn out. That's when I spotted the lake. Now I'm not much of a swimmer, but at that point I was willing to try anything. As I got closer to the water, I noticed this small fishing boat. There were three guys in it, just chilling and fishing. I started yelling and waving my arms, probably looking like a total maniac. Hey, hey, over here, help? The guys in the boat just stared at me. I must have been a sight, all scratched up, covered in mud, yelling about some monster. They didn't move to help, just watched me like I was some kind of wildlife show. With the creature closing in and the boat guys not helping, I did the only thing I could think of. I climbed a tree. Not the smartest move I know, but I was running out of options. I scrambled up as high as I could go, which wasn't that high, to be honest. It wasn't exactly a redwood or anything. Just as I reached the top branches that could hold my weight, I heard the monster starting to climb after me. Looking down, I saw this thing effortlessly scaling the tree. Then I looked out at the boat, which had drifted even further away. That's when it really hit me. This might be it. This might be how I go out. But then, just as I was about to give up hope, I heard this loud crack. At first, I thought a branch was breaking. But then I saw the monster's head jerk back. One of the guys in the boat had had taken a shot. The guy fired two more times, hitting the monster in the head and body. It fell out of the tree and landed on the ground with a thud. For a second, I thought it was over. But get this. The thing just got up, shook itself off like it had just taken a refreshing dip in the lake, and casually strolled back into the woods. Hit three times, and it acted like it had been hit with spitballs. I couldn't believe my eyes. The boat finally came closer, and the guys were all freaked out. They kept asking where a wolf that big could have come from, what it was, all that stuff. I had no answers for them. I was just as confused and scared as they were. Eventually, I made it back to my car. I locked the doors, cranked up the AC, and promptly passed out. When I came to, part of me wondered if I'd dreamed the whole thing. But the scratches and bruises told me it was all too real. To this day, I have no idea what that thing was or where it came from. I've never seen anything like it since, thank God. Sometimes I wonder if it's still out there, in that forest, waiting for its next victim. Look, I know this story sounds nuts. If someone told me this, I'd probably think they were making it up or had eaten some weird mushrooms in the woods. But I swear on everything, this is exactly what happened to me. Believe it or don't. That's up to you. I'm just glad I can talk about it without people thinking I'm totally crazy. So yeah, that's my story. Wild, right? Makes you think twice about taking solo hikes in the wilderness, that's for sure.
as the late afternoon sun dipped behind the towering pines of the National Forest in northern Wisconsin, Tom Erickson wiped the sweat from his brow and checked his watch. It was nearing 7 p.m., and he knew he'd have to wrap up soon if he wanted to make it back to his truck before dark. The 43-year-old mycologist had spent the last three days deep in the forest, cataloging rare species of fungus as part of an ongoing ecological survey for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Tom's work often took him to remote corners of the state's vast wilderness areas, but this particular section of the forest felt especially isolated. He hadn't seen another soul since parking his pickup at a rarely used fire road nearly 10 miles back. The only sounds that broke the eerie silence were the occasional calls of barred owls and the soft crunch of pine needles beneath his boots. As he knelt to examine a cluster of unusual bracket fungi growing on a rotting log, Tom suddenly realized that the air felt different. The forest seemed to have gone unnaturally still. Even the ever-present hum of insects had faded to nothing. Suddenly, he heard a twig snap somewhere behind him, the sound sharp and jarring in the stillness. Tom whirled around, expecting to see a deer or perhaps a black bear, both common enough sights in these woods. What he saw instead made his blood run cold. Standing at the edge of the small clearing, partially obscured by the lengthening shadows, was a creature that defied explanation. It stood upright on two legs, easily seven feet tall, with a muscular, canine-like body covered in dark fur. But it was the thing's face that sent waves of primal terror coursing through Tom's body. It had the elongated snout and pointed ears of a wolf. But its eyes, dear God, its eyes were disturbingly human-like, gleaming with an intelligence that had no place in an animal's gaze. Man and beast regarded each other in tense silence, Tom's couldn't comprehend and felt like it was some weird, out-of-body experience. It just made no sense. Was this some kind of escaped experiment? Or was he face to face with the legendary creature that had haunted the nightmares of Northwood's residents for generations? The so-called Wisconsin Dogman. Before Tom could even think about reaching for his phone to document the encounter, the creature's lips pulled back in a snarl revealing its gleaming, razor-sharp teeth. A low growl rumbled from its chest, a sound so deep and menacing that Tom felt shake deep into his bones. In that moment, every survival instinct was telling Tom to get away somehow, but he knew that fleeing would likely only provoke the creature to chase. Instead, he slowly began to back away, never breaking eye contact with the creature and keeping it right in front of him. The dogman took a step forward, its massive, clawed hands flexing at its sides, opening and closing slowly. Tom's heart was in overdrive as he continued his careful retreat, praying that he wouldn't trip and lose his momentum. He had no illusions about his chances if the creature decided to attack. He knew he would be a goner. Just as Tom was certain the dogman was about to lunge, a series of howls echoed through the forest coming from somewhere to the west. The creature's ears swiveled towards the sound, and for a brief moment, its attention wavered. Tom seized the opportunity. In one fluid motion, he turned and sprinted deeper into the woods, abandoning his research equipment and backpack in his desperation to escape. All he cared about was staying alive. He ran blindly through the underbrush, branches whipping at his face and arms as he crashed through the forest. He felt none of it. Behind him, he heard the thunderous sound of pursuit, accompanied by snarls and the snapping of branches. Tom pushed himself harder than he ever had before, fueled by sheer terror. He had no idea how long he ran or in what direction. His only thought was to put as much distance between himself and that thing as possible. Eventually, lungs burning and legs trembling, Tom burst out onto the overgrown fire road where he'd left his truck. By some miracle, he'd managed to circle back to his starting point. He thinks it's the only reason he's still alive. He fumbled with his keys, hands shaking violently as he unlocked the door and threw himself inside. 
as Tom peeled out onto the rutted dirt road, tires spinning and engine roaring, he chanced a glance in his rearview mirror. There, at the edge of the forest, right where he had exited, he caught a glimpse of a dark shape standing still. He was sure that the thing was watching him go. Then it melted back into the shadows of the forest as he got further away. Tom, like many others who have similar encounters, would replay his encounter over and over in his mind, questioning his own sanity. He never reported what he'd seen, feeling foolish in his own mind, let alone saying it out loud. But from that day forward, Tom Erickson never again ventured into the deep woods alone, even though he never told anyone why. And he always made sure to be safely out of the forest well before nightfall. He said he has definitely learned his lesson.